Seymour. And as part of my duties as a member of the WRI Alumni Association, I'll be your moderator this afternoon. Anyone who has chosen to come to this session knows that over the last few years, there has been an incredibly rapid evolution in technology and innovation, which I would argue has been driven by both the supply side and the demand side. Let me highlight three drivers from each of these perspectives. From the supply side, we've had incredible advances in technology, especially remote sensing technology, which has dramatically increased the precision and amount of the data that it's possible to collect. But the second is we've also had advances in data availability. The opening of the Landsat archive, the creation of Global Forest Watch as a platform, changing norms of transparency regarding what we expect governments and corporations to disclose. So for all those reasons, there have been big changes in what it's possible to access in terms of data. And thirdly, there have been advances in computing power, which has changed what's possible to do with all that data in reasonable time frames and at reasonable cost. But there's also been big changes on the demand side for this data. Perhaps the one that's in front of mind with the UNFCCC negotiations going on this week is the need for data, particularly at the national level, to implement what's been negotiated in the context of the UNFCCC and Red Plus in particular for MRV, for drivers, for safeguards. But in addition, there are other things going on. It was just a year ago that Wilmar International made its big pledge to no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation, palm oil supply chains. And we've had seen a wave of similar commitments since then. And new data is needed to ensure compliance with these new commitments to deforestation-free supply chains. And last but not least, there's also been a change in legal and normative frameworks about recognizing rights to forest land, and in particular, indigenous people's rights that rely on spatial information to implement. And my sense is that there's been a mutual ratcheting up between the supply side and the demand side, with new technologies enabling innovations on the policy side, which creates demand, and then new demands driving innovations in technology. The purpose of today's panel is twofold. First, we're going to hear from some of the world's top experts on that supply side who are generating all this incredible new information and data. And they're going to give us some highlights about the latest. But we're also going to hear some responses from the demand side and a discussion with all of you about the degree to which that supply side and that demand side are lining up. My role is also twofold. That is to keep us on time and keep us on topic. And those of you who know me know I can be ruthless in doing both. So without more from me, let me call first on Greg Asner. Greg is a faculty scientist at the Carnegie Department of Global Ecology and is also affiliated with Stanford University. And Greg's been doing some work here in Peru, and he's going to tell us what it's about. Greg. Thank you very much. Everybody can hear me? Thank you, Francis, and thank you, WRI, for the invitation to be here. Um, we were given eight minutes, so what I'm going to do is give you an abstract of a long... in a way that's effective for conservation decision making. Hmm. Nothing. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, what I won't be talking about is deforestation monitoring, which has gone mainstream with the WRI and the University of Maryland work that's been going on. I'm sure Matt Hansen's going to talk about that. 
What I won't be talking about specifically here that I want, that was asked to mention at least is my, my sense of where we are with forest degradation monitoring. Sure, it's more challenging. It's pretty advanced in the academic sector and it's moving its way into the more the operational side and we could talk about that later. Third, Sasan's gonna really hit this moderate resolution global carbon mapping and how it has uh, afforded huge progress in doing national scale work. I'm gonna focus on high resolution carbon stock mapping as a way of trying to move towards hectare by hectare issuance of credits for all stakeholders in a country like Peru. I wanna talk a bit for a moment about the critical hectare. The hectare is the most common unit of land management, ownership, and tenure in the world, outside of the United States and a few other countries. You see about the size of a hectare there, and that's been our goal for going to the national scale high resolution carbon mapping that is actionable by all stakeholders. One of the problems with that is that doing hectare resolution work on the ground is extremely labor intensive. Here in the forest of Peru, we often have well over 600 trees of at least uh, 10 centimeter diameter in a single hectare. So it's laborious, very hard to measure and remeasure on the ground. So what we've been doing and the community has been doing as well is moving towards high resolution, large area sampling using new technologies such as LIDAR, which is called, uh, is an acronym for light detection and ranging. LIDAR doesn't just measure the cover of the forest, it measures the height and the 3D partitioning of the vegetation like you see here. These are actual cross sections from LIDAR scans. From these LIDAR data, you can easily measure the height of the vegetation and its, uh, and its layering. Here's an, a quick view for those of you who are new to LIDAR to see exactly what the imagery looks like in its most basic form. This is the interoceanic highway that runs out of Puerto Maldonado in southern Peru. You see tall trees in, in red and you see deforested lands in blue. The technology is becoming mainstream, but really the, one of the big challenges has, for the science community was, and I put it in the past tense, converting these kinds of uh, 3D images to biomass stocks or carbon densities as we, we call them. This is just a quick shot, a view of what's going on in Peru with a very large field national, uh, nationally distributed field inventory network that we've installed here, showing the relationship between LIDAR metrics in 3D on the x-axis or the horizontal axis and the actual mass of the forest estimated using standard allometric methods. It's that relationship that we have as a science community and in my team and with our partnerships here developed and redeveloped to the point where it's very stable and reliable, and that's been a critical ingredient for making this science more useful and more applicable. This is a critical graph here that people uh, often don't uh, know about, is that if you go out into a, a hectare of forest in Peru or anywhere else in the tropics and measure it at a, at a whole hectare, your, at, your measurements are actually estimates of biomass. They're not the actual biomass. But if you were to cut down that hectare and weigh it, the measurements made in the field tend to match up to the measurements that are uh, cut and weigh kind of measurements, which we don't want to be doing for lots of obvious reasons. They tend to match within about 10 to 20% uncertainty between the two. This graph shows that you can do the same with an airborne LIDAR. At a hectare resolution where the red lines meet, the uncertainty between field estimated biomass or carbon density and LIDAR derived is about 10% uncertain. Now we don't know who's more accurate, the aircraft data that come from LIDAR or field, laborious field measurements. And that's the place we wanted to be in 2009 in Copenhagen. We weren't there and we're there today. It's become operational, standard. As I say, it's uh, hard to publish nowadays because it's so routine. It's still not enough. The, another ingredient is to take those LIDAR data and scale them up to the national level. There's this fallacy or this idea that aircraft are
did this in Peru. And one of the key things about doing this in Peru cost effectively is you know ahead of time how much LiDAR data you're going to need. And by doing that, you fly around the country until you literally paint these large 100 by 100 kilometer grid cells with at least a red color, which would be 5,000 hectares inside this 100 by 100 kilometer grid scale, s cell. And if, this was a, a, if the animation was working, you'd see it play out across the country efficiently, cost effectively, and massive sampling in a way that could never be achieved on the ground. What you get in the end are these maps. On the left is the uh, high resolution carbon map of Peru that were, is now available publicly and we're announcing a fit more officially on Monday. And the uncertainty map on the right side, a critical piece. We know exactly how uncertain we are hectare by hectare throughout this country. Uh, validation is important. These are independent validations of uh, 57 one hectare plots, a day of flying on the x-axis, years of work on the y-axis, a distribution of carbon stocks across the country derived from that. Carbon stocks by jurisdiction, high resolution, well known, well below or well uh, within any jurisdiction and a, a balance sheet for the, car, for the country of Peru where now we can overlay maps of oil concessions and logging concessions and compare those to protected areas and come up ultimately with the real thing we want in a, in a startup, start in a, in a, in a start, uh, in, in a first high resolution mapping of a country, which is a balance sheet for the country where we understand now the threats, the protections and the opportunities all based on high resolution mapping. Last point, people ask me, how much does it cost nowadays? Prices have dropped for us as, as academics who teach it and train it and fly it to about one US cent per hectare. And I'll end by saying two things. These maps are available freely online and we can't do this work without our host country partners, in this case, the Peruvian Ministry of Environment. Thank you. It's very slow. I want to ask you one question before we move on to the next speaker. Um, you talked about the fallacy of high-cost airborne LIDAR, and I, I know that you were a, a co-author of a, a famous piece where you offered to, or said it could be done, to apply LIDAR across the tropics for only $250 million in four years, right? Um, I've been working with Scott Getz at Words Hole. We've commissioned a paper um, about, you know, what's the state of measurement and monitoring for Red Plus. And he's real excited about this prospect of mounting a LIDAR sensor on a satellite. Does that change your plan? It, it improves the plan dramatically. So you're talking about a NASA mission that was just selected to go put a LIDAR on board the International Space Station. It's going to be PI'd out of uh, the principal investigators at the University of Maryland. And that instrument is going to provide us this incredible tropical coverage. That's going to accelerate everything I showed here. No longer will we have to necessarily be flying airplanes around, doing it country by country. We might just jump over that step. A, the critical piece of scientific input is converting those 3D images to, to biomass stocks. And that's what we in the science community have really hammered in the last five years. And I think we've achieved that capability of converting one to the other. Great. Thank you. Sure. Well, next up, I'm going to invite Professor Matthew Hansen. Uh, Matt is at the University of Maryland and uh, has specialized in land use change mapping with remote sensing and published the article that we're all uh, now familiar with uh, about a year ago at this time. And Matt's going to tell us what he's been up to lately. Thanks, Francis. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Thank you, WRI, for having me. Um, I'm going to give a couple updates on our, on our work with monitoring global scale uh, forest change with Landsat data, uh, this fantastic global, globally acquired, freely available multispectral uh, information set. Uh, our work has been to, to try and push generic algorithms at the global scale by mining the Landsat archive. We turned this into uh, a forest extent, a tree cover extent and change product, which uh, some people have, have used. And uh, uh, it's this gross dynamic of trees coming and going in different landscapes. Um, we've disaggregated that by annual time steps. And now our task is to move that forward. We're also moving it backwards. This is 2000, 2012 with Landsat 7. We're going to go before 2000 to get longer baselines established. And now we're moving into an update. So this 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 map shows 2013 as a as a new pro, as a new result. Our 2013 
uh, product includes Landsat 8 data, so it's a little slow in coming. We're going to release the 2003 pro 13 product this month or next month, or plus or minus. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't, don't hold me to anything, please. <laughs> it's coming. And then, uh, and then 2014 will be relatively quickly. It will not be this time next year where we get 2014. When we look at the product, this is a Landsat for Cambodia, just to give you some examples. Um, we have tree cover extent in green, loss in red. Uh, we have, uh, we're, we're encouraging people to use this in value-added applications, putting protected areas on top of the data, for example, in this, in this case, the white outlines. And then to, again, extend the record uh, from annual to 2013. So if we look at 2013, the red is the change that happened then. Um, and you see for Cambodia this ramping up, this dramatic forced transition from natural forest cover to higher order land uses. If we go to another country, for example, Cote d'Ivoire, we don't see as much the um, ramping up of change, but we see an episodic disturbance related to civil unrest and political instability, and we see the loss of a couple of protected areas and forest reserves, and the uh, latest product shows a very quiet Cote d'Ivoire. So again, different dynamics through time, what is going on in every, 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 every protected area when we look at this really almost has its own story, Thai National Forest being something quite intact in, in the Cote d'Ivoire. So again, we want to have a 30-meter record of every pixel on Earth. Where are trees coming and going? We want to have baselines of natural forest. We did this for Indonesia. We're going to try and extend it for the pan tropics. And then see, you know, document, confirm Brazil's decline and maybe the, the, the kind of sustenance of that decline in deforestation. Indonesia ramping up, but in this last year having a slower, a slower uh, rate of loss than DR Congo because of the lack of agro-industrial investment, uh, having a persistent but slightly increasing rate of forest loss due to local populations uh, uh, feeding themselves. I include Peru down the list. This is 22, 23, and 24, the largest gross forest uh, loss uh, countries over the 13-year period, and how Peru stands out as ramping up, particularly in the last couple of years. Interannual variability high in Peru due to, due to uh, drought years and, and fire. Um, anyway, all these different stories. Cambodia, again, uh, uh, quite an increase through time. So that's, that's the story for uh, the product, and it, it is kind of moving into operational mode. We are validating the product with, uh, with probability-based samples to figure out where, where we're accurate, where we're, where we're biased. In Africa, we find that we underestimate change, but in places like Latin America, we do very well in a one-to-one -one kind of a sense from the validation data compared to the, to the results. We also take our product and port it to national scales, and one of our strongest collaborations is with Minam, and Greg works with Minam in, in various all kinds of more capacities than we do. We're focusing just on activity data, taking this global process, de processing system and characterization method to the national scale and uh, getting a result that's going to be published next week is just a demonstration of how, how we can use this. The new thing for Global Forest Watch is an alarm system. So if we do annual updates of the globe, we have data in the interim. Why not report what's happening? And so we're moving Landsat into an alarm mode where if we have a nice look at a pixel, let's, let's, let's look at it and see if there was a forest disturbance uh, in, in, in the particular area. So this is a, a picture on the left that's kind of interesting. It's the last good look of the land through no, mid-November for Peru. So we populate the most recent cloud-free observation over a country, and we examine that pixel if it indicates forest loss. And this Next slide is the cumulative alarms for Peru. It's overemphasized so you can see it. It's not as dramatic as that, but just to see the pattern of the alarms. And then as we go through an example here, I'll show you in real time, up in the top left is the date, and I'm doing this in 16-day periods, but you see there's a single image that comes through. We have an algorithm that flags it. It's meant to be conservative because it's meant to be more of an information tool, possibly a planning or enforcement tool, just like Detour with Protus. primarily the, the, the gold mining. Example of a blowdown. This happened early in the year. It's like a January event, out of sync with the rest of the dynamic, which is really tied to the dry season, July, August, September uh, here. But this is a big blowdown that occurred in January through the time period. And then the last example being a, a logging road. And when we look at the alarms over the 2014 period up through the middle of November, extensive logging roads east of the river, 
uh, in Yucca Yali uh, province, and uh, this is an example near uh, Pucalpa, where we have a logging road, and you can see the, uh, the, the, the disturbances off to the side of the road of the, of the extraction of, of timber. And finally, working in a kind of uh, targeting way where we have this generic algorithm that is running at a national scale, and when we see a, a, an alarm, maybe we can task a very high resolution image. In this case, it's Skybox from Google to kind of confirm and get down to really to kind of see more contextual information on what our alarm is showing us. So this is just an example of Skybox data on the lower left to confirm the alarms uh, of, a, of a looks like agro-industrial probably palm east of the Ucayali River south of Iquitos. So in general, you know, it's, it's really ex exercising this Landsat archive to squeeze as much information out of it as we can, um, and, uh, and, and the potential for using it in, in, in an integrative fashion with carbon maps, such as uh, Greg's or, or Sasan's are, are really high, and to, to look at it for protected area, monitoring the same kind of themes that, that, that Greg laid out in his table. Um, we're looking forward to it, but the key thing for us is to reduce latency and report our accuracy so that people can use it confidently in their applications in a timely fashion. Thank you. So Matt, I know everybody's interested in this latest alarm uh, data that you're talking about, but I want to go back for just a minute to the, the paper last year and the annual um, monitoring. You know, since your paper was published, I know I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard, a lot of reactions uh, to what you've done and, and its significance. And they've ranged over a pretty wide uh, range. And, and for me, over on this side are people that I encounter in development world who, you know, are sort of seeing this gee whiz, you know, technology and they say, wow, that's great. We can measure forest cover change and we don't need all this national level MRV stuff anymore because we can just do it all from this one global data set. But then we have the people over here who tend to be people who are down in the weeds working on MRV systems at the national level or below, and they say, the horror, you know, Matt's data set can't possibly be sufficiently accurate or, you know, uh, adapted to our national circumstances, so that's, that's not what we need at the national level. Which is it? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's true. We, we say that when you try to extrapolate an algorithm at the global scale, if you cut out your backyard, you'll do a better map of your backyard, right? Extrapolating these signatures and expecting the same precision everywhere is a, is a, a tall order. Um, we, when we work in Peru or Congo or Indonesia, we say, you, you know your landscapes, you know your dynamics. If you calibrate the algorithm to your context, you should make a better product than ours. So we're very happy to advocate that. Um, so, and if that might even be too high in order, you can use this product to stratify and do probability-based samples of high resolution or other, other kind of data to get an estimate that you own, using this as leverage really to tell you where to look, because it's not so bad that, it, that it's missing dynamics. It may not be the area, but it's, it's a good stratifier. So there's different ways to use it in a leverage sense at the national scale, and we're, we're all for that. Uh, whether it's doing the Landsat mapping directly or using it to, to, to stratify and sample other higher order data sets. Okay, thanks. So next up, I would like to invite Dr. Sasan Sachi. Uh, Dr. Sachi is a senior scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He also has an affiliation with the Center for Tropical Research at UCLA. And he's going to tell us about his new global map of terrestrial carbon. Thank you so much, Francis, and Excellent. WRI for Excellent. inviting me. Um, what I'd like to talk about is just follow on what Greg and Matt said and move it a little bit to the global, what scientific community is interested, and also how it can translate to implementations of RED in different regions of the world. I'd like to start with the, if I can move, with the big picture that I usually put it in the uh, presentation, which basically brings the scientific community much closer with the policymakers and civil society. We're all interested in knowing exactly what the climate is doing. The atmosphere is the integrator of the, uh, all the carbons emitted to the, uh, to the atmosphere. And then part of it stays there and part of it goes to the forest. So if land use change contributes only 10 to 15 percent, but the forest that absorbs this carbon plays a major role, almost quarter of the emission gets absorbed. So we are very much interested in the scientific community, what that forest is doing. 
tropics probably is almost 70% of the sink globally. So we like to have a consistent and systematic measure of these forests. And if you look at um, the current state of the art, the uh, distribution of the carbon in the forest and the area of forest is uh, panned in, in the latitudinal scale from zero being the tropics and going to the temperate and boreal zone in both re regions. The yellow lines you, is the inventory data collected on the ground. So you notice that although the b carbon in the uh, tropics is the highest, we have almost no inventory data in the, in the tropics, but we have a lot in the temperate and boreal zone where most of the developing world are. We need to have a systematic observation of the globe where we bring the inventory almost consistent globally, and then we can monitor it. So to do that, the, um, this task has been recognized by the communities, NASA and Europeans and other uh, space agencies have been investing a lot of money. This is just a three examples of um, uh, JEDI, just recently has been approved by NASA, a LIDAR system on the space station, uh, the biomass mission by ESA, European Space Agency, and another mission by NASA radar mission, that almost by 2020, we're gonna have a global system of observation amounting to almost $1.5 billion investment to monitor the forest globally. And I think that's uh, a major step recognized by uh, taxpayers. Um, so, but before 2020, we're gonna do something else. We're gonna use all our assets, things that Greg has uh, covered, or Matt has covered, to follow the carbon and the activity data. So we can use the airborne systems and uh, to monitor the forest, to map the uh, carbon, calibrate it with some plot data, even limited plot data, and then use the uh, satellite data to scale it up at project to national levels. And doing this, we have developed a strategy to monitor and um, to quantify the uncertainty in our carbon estimates. And that's the key thing, because that's what we can improve over time as the data becomes rich, both from the ground data and the remote sensing observation. So monitoring the uncertainty is extremely important for us. Um, so all of these things always translates into implementation and cost. So if you look at the, what is happening, this is the cost uh, model, which we don't have an exact model, but what is happening globally is, as Greg showed, the cost of the collecting data over the airborne system is actually reducing drastically uh, through time and also when you cover large areas. That is not comparable if you want to do the inventory from the uh, ground measurements. And that's an important point. So to just prepare ourselves for 2020, we try to create something global, which can be also used on the national level for um, uh, national MRV systems. We use the satellite observation of the forest height, which is a very systematic sampling, if you see in this picture, almost every 20 to 50 kilometer has one tract of the radar, a uh, LIDAR, and it's probably more random than anybody can think of. And this data, when it gets um, basically converted to the biomass using ground measurements, each of these LIDAR uh, footprints, which you see in those cylinders, can be converted to the biomass, as is shown with the airborne system. And then you can scale it up with the uh, satellite data to create this global map. And then you can have a consistent map globally, which can be in a different resolution. This one that we just generated goes close to one hectare, and it gives you an uncertainty uh, map as well. But the uncertainty is really high at one hectare, but it reduces as you aggregate over larger areas. So you can easily do a project level uh, or national level or uh, regional level estimates. Or if you want something more accurate, then you can fly Greg's LIDAR over your area. And so the next is basically to demonstrate this just for a couple of minutes is the review of this whole global data sets. We had to work with huge data sets from different satellites to make this happen. Most of the forest areas globally are cloud covered, and so we need to accumulate a lot of data set. We use the NASA's 
uh, supercomputer at Ames and to put this data set together and then you create a map like this by aggregating the data set. To just show you a little bit about the resolution, we're just going to zoom into from Lima, move up to through the Andes and go down to the Amazon and then we can stop the video whenever you, uh, the time is up. So it would basically provide you something at the land scale, scale on biomass distribution and also it captures to some level the degradation and deforestation that comes in because we use Landsat and radar data in this. And you go from the Andes to much higher biomass regions and then you come to areas like Acre where you see the footprint of deforestation and you can move towards the central Amazon where the wood density of the forest increases, the biomass increases, and you can see the, uh, la uh, the mosaic of deforestation, degradation, and also different vegetation types in the Amazon. And this video would take you to uh, different regions and it zooms into areas where are close to Manaus and Rio Negro and then it goes down to uh, capturing other areas of uh, deforestation through Trans-Amazonian Highway, uh, south of the Tapajos National Park, and moves up to the coast. So you see the variations of the carbon. So it's, it's a challenging project. The data is going to be launched after our paper gets published. However, it's, it's basically not only a challenge for us to put this together, it's a challenge for the community to uh, come up with data sets that we can actually improve this uh, methodology and um, this is Gabon actually, you see one of the largest forests and the Lope National Park that goes to the Bateke regions and moves uh, down the stream. We can stop the video whenever time is up, but yeah. this is basically the... Uh, okay. Time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a seat. So, Sasan, I will award you the prize for the coolest gimmick in your presentation on, based on that. That was, that was pretty cool. Um, so, uh, earlier this year, the Packard Foundation exercised some questionable judgment in asking for my advice on what they might do to improve the data availability related to the extent and depth of peatlands in Indonesia. And so I spent a lot of time on the phone talking to experts on how do you estimate, you know, carbon content, you know, of, of peatlands. And more than one of them said to me that actually we've reached the extent of what can be done with remote sensing and it's not good enough. Let me use that as an entry point to a question to you. I mean, to what degree is your new data set in fact going to be useful to people at the project level who may have a Red Plus project in a peatland area or want to identify where high carbon stock areas in a palm oil concession. I mean, can you, can you speak to that? Well, if we let the um, uh, video go, then we would go to Kalimantan and we would see some of the peatlands and uh, degradation or deforestation. It is true that we cannot estimate at this moment the carbon in the soil in the peat. We can definitely estimate it in the vegetation above it. However, I wouldn't say we've reached our limit. The biomass mission being developed and launched around 2020 by Europeans has this P-band radar, which has a penetration depth of almost one meter or higher into the soil. And we are using it in, in, through a NASA Earth Venture program over North America to estimate soil water content uh, up to one meter depth. And so it is possibility that we can get data on the ground to do this thing. And I'm sure people would come up with much better system in the future. But at this moment, yes. But five years or 10 years from now, God knows. Okay, great. So our next speaker is Crystal Davis. And Crystal is the senior manager at the World Resources Institute for the Global Forest Watch. Um, which is a pretty, a, a set of cool tools, and she's going to give us uh, an update on what's happening with GFW. Okay, thank you, Francis. And I'm going to be talking very briefly about Global Forest Watch today. I'm very impressed with how everyone has kept on time, so I'm going to try my best to keep with that trend. 
So as we've seen from today's presentations, we are now able to map and fo monitor forest landscapes with an incredible amount of spatial and temporal resolution. And we can not only do this across entire countries, but we can do this across the entire world. And as Sasan just said, who can even imagine what we will be able to do five to 10 years from now? But we also know that good data is not sufficient. If we fail to be able to translate this data into meaningful action on the ground, we will leave future generations to ponder why we put so much effort into monitoring the destruction of our forest landscapes without doing anything to stop it. Unfortunately, there's still a pretty significant gap that we often see between the types of data sets that we're talking about on this panel and the actual people on the ground who are trying to make decisions about how to manage their landscapes. And there are many reasons for this gap, but I think one of the key challenges is that the average person who works for an NGO, a business, or a government agency often lacks the expertise to be able to make sense of these very complex data sets and distill it into an actionable insight that they can use to make decisions on the ground. And as the only person who's spoken so far who's not a leading expert in remote sensing science, I consider myself among these data challenged. Global Forest Watch is a new partnership and platform which seeks to bridge this gap between data and decision making. We seek to connect cutting edge science and technology like such that we've been featuring on this panel today with forest stakeholders and decision makers around the world. And importantly, we seek to do this in a way that makes it incredibly easy for people to understand the data, to analyze it, to interpret it, and ultimately to take action. And in order to make all this possible, Global Forest Watch is a very unique and rapidly growing partnership, which now contains over 60 organizations and companies around the world, many of whom are on this panel today or in the room. And these partners are bringing technology, science, data, and policies perspective that make Global Forest Watch possible. And the role of my organization, the World Resources Institute, is really just to try to bring all of these pieces together. So for those of you who are already familiar with the Global Forest Watch platform, you'll recognize this as our homepage. We're actually going to be updating and launching a new homepage in the next couple of months, so you can keep your eye out for that. And essentially, Global Forest Watch is a platform that allows anyone around the world with an internet connection to access, visualize, analyze, and download the most up-to-date and spatially precise information about how forests are changing around the world. And critically, all this is made available completely free of charge. So users of Global Forest Watch can zoom in to an area of interest, and they can dynamically visualize high-resolution data showing forest change over time. So what we're seeing here is by zooming into southern Brazil, the 30-meter annual tree cover loss data that Matt Hansen and his team developed and he was talking about earlier. Um, but we can visualize many different data sets in this way on Global Forest Watch. And a critical aspect is that you can take this data and then overlay it with other contextual information and high resolution satellite imagery that gives you a more complete picture of what's actually happening on the ground. So in this case in Brazil, I've pulled up indigenous territories in blue, and you can see in a very visually compelling way the critical role that indigenous communities have played in conserving the Brazilian Amazon. Users can also conduct their own analysis on the website, so you can simply draw a polygon on the map and generate on-the-fly statistics, or you can make a quick visit to our country pages where we have pre-calculated national and subnational statistics on forest change. If you're interested in monitoring a specific area into the future, you can subscribe to alerts, and Global Forest Watch will send you a monthly email with latitude and longitude coordinates of any recent forest disturbance that was detected by one of our systems. And if you've actually seen something that you want to report and share with other users of Global Forest Watch, you can simply drop a pin on the map and upload a video, a photo, or a comment to share. And finally, I just want to emphasize that we really strive to make all this information very easy to download and to share. Whether you're trying to access the raw data for your research purposes, or you've made an interesting map view that you want to share with a friend or embed into a blog post. But this is all really just the beginning for Global Forest Watch. We launched the platform in February of this year, and it's still in a beta format. Uh, we've had an incredible amount of interest. We have users coming to the website from literally every country in the world. Uh, and since February, we've really been working almost around the clock to continuously upgrade the user interface based on the feedback we're getting from our users, and also to try to bring new and improved data to the platform, like some of the data sets that we were previewing here today. But I actually think that one of the most exciting developments is related to how our users of Global Forest Watch are starting to take the data and apply it to their decision making. 
As an example, dozens of com companies, major international companies, are starting to explore how Global Forest Watch can help them meet their commitments to eliminate deforestation from commodity supply chains by 2020. So we're working with companies like Unilever and Cargill to develop a specialized set of Global Forest Watch commodities tools, which will allow companies to be able to assess and monitor deforestation risk across their supply chains, drilling down to the mill level and even to the concession level. Global Forest Watch is also supporting governments in Southeast Asia to respond and address fires and haze. Uh, the Global Forest Watch Fires app, which we launched earlier this year with the government in, in Indonesia, allows law enforcement authorities to view daily NASA file, fire alerts and then overlay these with other relevant info that can help them to target uh, and have a more rapid response. So for example, you can take a look at near real-time wind data provided by NOAA. Uh, and this lets you, gives you a sense of where the greatest downwind impacts in terms of air quality might be across the region. And thanks to a partnership with Digital Globe, we can also view ultra high resolution imagery that allows us to quickly confirm and prioritize suspected fires. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but I also just wanted to mention that Global Forest Watch partners are also starting to explore applications for decision makers related to biodiversity conservation uh, and also uh, climate change or MED Plus, and these apps are going to be developed and prototyped during 2015. So I really believe that these types of simple and targeted apps are actually the best way to connect these, type, these big data sets with some of the um, specific needs that decision makers and civil society, government, and businesses have. And critically, since Global Forest Watch is an open source platform, anyone can create an app using our open data and our open technology. So our long-term vision is actually to make Global Forest Watch the app store and have all of you become the app developers. And I have one minute left. Uh, as much as I talk very enthusiastically all the time about Global Forest Watch, I do think it's useful to touch on some of the challenges that we still confront in terms of trying to make this data truly useful and applicable for decision makers. And I think there are many more challenges than what I've listed on the slide, but just to try to get to some of the, the top challenges that I've been really thinking about over the past year, um, the first one is really about communication. We know that no data set is perfectly accurate, uh, and I think that's okay. Data doesn't have to be 100% accurate to be useful, uh, but we do know that there are risks associated with people misinterpreting or misusing data and causing harm. So I think that when it comes to these really big and technical data sets, we need to find better ways to communicate to the non-expert users uh, who are interested in understanding them. Uh, even when we were talking, talking earlier about um, uncertainty, do, do people really know what that means? Uh, the second issue is around different scales of data. So we're talking about the value today of having these globally consistent yet locally precise data sets, but also the need to have nationally developed data sets that are even more locally precise and are customized to national circumstances. And the problem is that often these global national data sets, when you line them up against each other, they're not in perfect agreement. But how do we start moving that conversation away from disagreement towards trying to think about how these data sets can be used in a more complementary way? And Matt started to get that with his comments as well. And then the last challenge I want to raise is about just the overwhelming quantity of data that we are facing um, and will continue to face into the future. Sometimes it feels like we can be drowning in data and not really getting anything out of it. Uh, I think that as we move towards bigger and bigger data in the future, we also need to have better, faster, and more automated ways of looking across these disparate data sets and turning it into relevant insights for decision makers. So that's it, thank you. Uh, some critical information on this last slide that disappeared. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you, Crystal. I'm going to um, avoid the temptation of asking my own question and save more time for questions from, from the audience. So we've now heard from three experts uh, on the supply side and uh, what they are able to offer now in terms of data and analysis. We've heard from a platform that aspires to bridge the gap between the data supply side and decision makers. And last but not least, we have a representative from the demand side, and in fact, specifically, a decision maker. So I'm particularly pleased to introduce the Honorable Lourdes Lopez. Uh, Congresswoman Lopez is on the chairwoman of the Environment Committee of the Mexican Congress. She is also the federal deputy for Mexico's Ecological Green Party and previously served as the Secretary for Environment and Natural History for the state of Chiapas. Uh, 
So I can't think of anyone uh, better positioned to give us some reflections on the degree to which all of this revolution in data availability and accessibility is making her job easier in decision making uh, to promote the values that we all share. Congresswoman Lopez. Gracias. Oh, and uh, Congresswoman Lopez will be speaking in Spanish, so um, if you need translation, now is the time to tune to Channel 2, I believe it is. Thank you, first of all. My party is called Green Party, Colleges Party, but it's just uh, called also Clean Mexico. But uh, I may not be getting the, cool, the award to the coolest presentation. I haven't brought uh, a presentation. I'll simply talk with you. First of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, those who have dedicated time, effort, and knowledge to developing these technological tools that are very useful for decision makers. Unfortunately, and this is something we must acknowledge, those of us who are on the public administration side, on the policy side, on the legislation side, that these areas of government, of administration, well, I think this could be generalized. Unfortunately, Mexico is no exception, and neither is Latin America. What I mean is that uh, we are very far from science and technology. Unfortunately, the decision-making process uh, very often is subject to political issues or issues that may result in more votes, more electoral votes, uh, rather than uh, making uh, well-informed decisions. Uh, I've always been convinced that to have the right information allows us decision makers to make the right decisions. I also think it is important to point out that when designing laws, when designing a, a public policy agenda, when deciding immediate actions, around climate change issues. We need to have all this information, but this information should also be available to us of easy access. For example, I am a lawyer, and if all of a sudden they show me a platform with the data we've just seen, I may not be able to understand all that, I'm sure. I say this because in public administration, and more specifically in positions where you get there by vote, uh, Political parties appoint people that may be able to win elections. So we need to generate a mechanism that may allow you to have some kind of translation, shall we say, of all those technical scientific data resulting from those platforms into uh, aspects that may be immediately applied. We need to have that practical exercise that may allow us to know and to understand and above all to use them because that's, what the, that's why the platforms are created for, right? So I would also like to say something very specific for Mexico. Bear in mind that these platforms are directly related to um, changes in land use. Mexico is not a highly industrialized country. 60% of uh, emissions into the atmosphere are due to changes in land use. And usually those changes in land use are related to the growth uh, of the uh, farming frontier in my country. So having these tools would allow us to know exactly about these uh, dynamics in the in terms of change in land use, but also in aspects related to forestry preservation. So how in Mexico we could go from conservation to sustainable management of forests. So if we have the information you generate, that would allow us to issue the right public policies to protect forests and also to protect the farming frontier. Especially those platforms that are linking uh, mining issues or hydrocarbons. Uh, so I insist, in the case of Mexico, 
now that uh, we have uh, gone through uh, energy reforms in our country, uh, these tools would be of great use in order to be able to implement some strategic measures to face these uh, mining and hydrocarbon related issues. Maybe this happens in many countries. The thing is that the authorities in charge of issuing uh, the authorizations to change land use receive uh, a manifest uh, of uh, environmental impact. For example, a mining company should submit uh, to the authorities a, a study, uh, an environmental impact assessment study, for example. But unfortunately, the information provided to the authority very often is not uh, correct information. And in most cases, uh, they do it on purpose. They hide information, the company will not come and say, well, there is some kind of forestry species that is at risk, or here we have this kind of bird that is uh, in the scientist list, because the mining company knows that it would be automatically denied the authorization that it needs. But if the environmental authorities uh, or if the pretending authorities that do this uh, environmental impact assessment have uh, this kind of platform, they would be able to match and compare their information with the information that is being submitted. Therefore, there is this need to match uh, these technological tools, scientific tools, uh, with uh, the uh, decision-making schemes. And to conclude, I would like to say that uh, probably very often from the government side, uh, it is thought that uh, implementing these technological uh, tools because of their cost uh, are regarded as an expenditure rather than an investment. Uh, so we need to generate a mechanism to educate the decision makers because this is not an expenditure. These are investments that will allow us to make the right decisions because we will have the right information. And in that way, we'll probably generate better public policies, better programs to solve the problems uh, that we have, uh, and uh, for legislators, better laws uh, in order to apply those laws, uh, especially in those areas where they are required. Thank you very much. I think we can all see why she gets the votes. Very well done. All right, so thanks to the admirable discipline of every single one of our panelists, we are very much on time. And since we started the whole session 15 minutes late, my understanding is that we get to go until 5.30. So we have more than half an hour to actually have a discussion and uh, entertain some comments and questions from the audience. Um, what I will do is uh, depend on a roving microphone and uh, call on you t and collect a basket of questions or comments that then I will throw to relevant members of the panel um, for response um, in groups. I ask that you remember what the focus of our session is supposed to be on, and that is this question of how well the supply of data is matching the demand that we need uh, for Red Plus and, and other purposes, and in particular, what may be the limitations or what may be the opportunities for aligning the supply side and the man demand side better. When I call on you, I ask that you introduce yourself and limit yourself to about three sentences to either make a point or pose a question. So with that, the floor is open. Okay, we got somebody in the far back. And on deck, I see Lars Levold, I think, and then somebody else right here for the first three. Hi, thank you for some very interesting presentations. We've seen some very impressive- Excuse me, who yes. are you? Ah, sorry, my name is Ashwin and I'm from C4. I'm a researcher there. Um, so thanks for these presentations. We've seen some very interesting and really impressive um, systems that are now in place. Uh, one of my questions is that uh, from one of the comments that Greg made, it sounds like even with some of these very impressive technologies, we face a ceiling on accuracy um, and that ceiling is something 
uh, in the range of 10% uncertainty. My question is, is that 10% uncertainty problematic for initiatives that are aiming at reductions in emissions and reductions in, car in uh, losses of, CO of carbon stocks Great that question. are more marginal, like 2%? Okay. Was, was it Lars Some back in here? Yeah. My name is Lars Lovell from Rainforest Foundation Norway, which means I'm interested in rainforests. I have a question uh, which is for uh, Global Forest Watch and Matt Hansen, and I have a second question which is only for Matt Hansen. Okay, so you got to apportion one sentence to one and two sentences to the other. <laughs> you are dealing with uh, tree cover change. But uh, as I understand from the web page, uh, you speak about deforestation. Now, I uh, am not very concerned if 1,000 square kilometers of fast growing trees in Indonesia and oil palm plantations are cut down to be replanted the same year. But they appear as the same loss of 1,000 square kilometers of intact rainforest. Uh, do you see that problem, and how are you dealing with it? Second question to Matt Hansen. I have checked the FIO data. According to FIO, there is 940,000 square kilometers in Indonesia of forest. According to you, it's 1.4 million square kilometers of forest. According to FIO, Deforestation was 1.7% in the 90s, and it's 0.7% now. Whereas you say that in the 90s, it was 10,000 square kilometers a year, and now it's doubled to 20,000. How can you explain that enormous discrepancy? Thank you. Got it. Okay, one more down here. Yeah. Hello, Hans Joost, the Greifswald University. I want to address the peatland issue. I think the most important thing now for peatlands is to identify where they are. Uh, the total carbon content is not that important. Uh, if you have a peatland, they have so much carbon. If you can identify where areas are with one meter of peat, you have, after drainage, 20 years, losing five centimeters of peat every year, and in 20 years, your techniques have developed. Okay. So let me turn to the panel. Who wants to go first on this question about uh, is the 10% uncertainty issue a, a, a problem? And actually, we're going to ask the demand side this too, but you guys start. Greg, take a first I, cut. I guess the question really is can the entire system handle the uncertainty that forced inventory would create? The 10 to 20% uncertainty is the inherent uncertainty in measuring a, a hectare of land on the ground. The good news is we can do it from the air with equal uncertainty or accuracy, however you want to think of it. So does the program that's being set up, whatever your program is, allow for actions based on those uncertainties, whether you're doing field-based work or aircraft-based work? A 10% uncertainty projected out to a larger area reduces. There's a, there's a mathematical way that this happens to minuscule uncertainties over when integrated over very large areas, say 100,000 hectares or a million hectares. The, the average 10% uncertainty on, the given, on any given hectare within it will diminish and average itself out. Think of it that way. It's well known in math and statistics. So what that does is the 10% projected over a large area reduces to a tiny number and it is very actionable at larger scales like thousands of hectares of these data or millions of hectares. If you want your program to operate on every single given hectare, then you have to be willing to discount, uh, absorb the discount rate apply a discount rate or absorb the, the fact that you have to discount for the uncertainty at that local, local, local scale. Okay. Do you guys have anything to add on that? No? No? Crystal, among your users? Yeah. On the tree cover? Oh, no, no, on that. On this issue? No? Yeah. But Congresswoman Lopez, I mean, for you as a decision maker, you know, 10% difference in the uh, uncertainty and the accuracy, is that something you can work with? Valido. Well, I think that technology is advancing continuously in such a way that little by little we will reduce that margin of uncertainty. Although from the logic of the decision maker, I'd rather have information with a 10% uncertainty to the lack of information totally. 
Muy bien, perfecto. Cristal. Sure, that's a that's a fantastic question. It's actually one that we hear a lot. So I think Matt Hansen's global tree cover loss data is, a, is an incredible resource like we have never seen before. But at the same time, you're right, it's not a complete answer to our questions about deforestation. And at least in the near term, we've tried to be very careful on Global Forest Watch with the language we use, and we were careful to say that it is tree cover loss and explain all those details in the fine print that no one wants to read. But I also think that it's important for us to take active measures to try to bring in the data that will create that local context that will give that more complete picture of what's actually happening in that data set. So just as one example, something that we've been working on this year and that we're going to be launching in the next couple of months uh, is a mapping of plantations. Uh, so we've completed this uh, mapping using remote sensing, satellite imagery for six countries now, but the plan is to scale that up to the tropics. Uh, and that, when you overlay it with Matt's data, tells you where tree cover loss is happening in a plantation and is not a big deal versus where it might be happening in, let's say, a primary forest. Uh, and just as an example, a result of that data, we're, we haven't published it yet, but we're looking at the preliminary results. In a place like Malaysia, we're seeing that about 70% more or less of the change is happening in plantations, which is what you'd expect in a country like Malaysia. So Matt, do you want to pick up on that one and then answer the question about the discrepancy in data on Indonesia? Sure. Crystal covered it pretty well. We, we, don't, we don't map deforestation. Deforestation implies a land use change where uh, a forest is removed and some other non-forest land use, such as you know, row crops, takes, takes the place of, of the natural forest. And that's not what we ever said we were mapping. We were mapping the biophysical presence or absence of trees. And um, you could imagine that over time, uh, any particular patch of ground that's going through a cycle of tree recovery and, 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 and clearing is a forestry land use. And we'll have that kind of data richness to explicitly map it from the signal um, in the future. Uh, a lot of people, especially in this room and with, with uh, biodiversity uh, groups and, and climate, we know that the big carbon stocks are in the natural forest, uh, and we know the high biodiversity is there as well. And we advocate bringing context to this data set. In the Congo, we have made primary forest, secondary forest layers at the beginning of the change uh, analysis to understand the carbon implications within the primary forest, the actual areas being cleared within the primary forest. In Indonesia in particular, uh, a student of mine from, seconded from the Ministry of Forestry uh, did a study to do exactly that for Indonesia because in Indonesia, uh, this is quite the political hot potato. It, it, there's a lot of dissembling, a lot of uh, lack of transparency on what's going on in the forestry sector historically. And we know that uh, it, uh, the last report, the three or four years, three years ago, I think, it, it, their official estimate was almost 500,000 hectares per year. We were getting a million hectares per year. And so we have these orthogonal stories. And uh, I know, and we work with the, the mapping division in the Ministry of Forestry, that they get thematically very similar outputs using different methods, but they get very thematically uh, different, uh, similar um, stories in, quanti in terms of quantity of forest loss. But the semantics about the definitions and how we filter that number are quite, <laughs> can be quite obscure. So for example, I'll give you primary forest, the, re the reports from, or the official report was something in the tens of, 24,000 hectares of primary forest loss officially from one Ministry of Forestry report in the last three or four years. Uh, what happens is if you take primary forest and you log it, it's relabeled as secondary forest. If you take secondary forest, then clear that and put that into palm, palm state or acacia plantation, no primary forest is lost. Okay, that's an example of the semantic game you can employ to confuse things, and whether it's purposeful or not, it doesn't matter. These are they're, you know, they have legitimate definitions. It's just the way they stack up, and you get a different story. So what, that, there's no you know secret to why we would get different stories. And then there's also official forestry land versus outside the forest. The official uh, government forest uh, land use. Same thing in, in Canada. You know, Canada has a, a forest land use that whether there are trees there or not, when they report to FAO, it's zero change historically. When they report to FAO, whether they cut it down or not, because it's a forestry land use, the trees will come back. It may take a century, but they'll come back. So, so the semantics behind use and cover can confound and confuse people. We have very good relations with the Ministry of Forestry, and, and it's been, you know, it's been with WRI. Um, uh, the World Bank and uh, slowly but surely 
that transparency has come, and there's been really good will within the Ministry of Forestry. And one of our papers, we, they, we had two uh, 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 colleagues visiting this past week, and we're going to write a paper based on this idea of natural forest and its change through time and bring this, explain these differences and bring them into con congruity. Uh, that's our objective, and it's a very simple one to do. It'll serve a lot of, a lot of good to clarify uh, what is confusing to a lot of people who don't under, you know, understand the subtleties of definitions. Great question, great answer. Um, I took the comment on peatlands as a comment, but does anybody on the panel want to respond to that at all? I don't know. I could say, you know, we can map wetlands. They're landform. We know where, we know, um, I, th I think from the road sensing perspective, besides the depth of peat and all that kind of stuff, we can, we know where wetlands are. They can be a stratifier for allocating field resources. We can go a step further and get into, like, let's say, likelihood of peat based on the dome and uh, the, some of the, some of the physiographic features. So I think that uh, remote sensing Aside from the direct quantification that that uh, Sasan, uh, we we aspire to, and Sasan mentioned uh, moving forward, we can use stuff right now to to help us allocate field resources to target it very efficiently from a remote sensing perspective. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there is uh, there is actually there are a couple of projects that they're working on this. Uh, the USGS has recently put together a coastal map of mangroves globally at 30 meter resolution. I don't know the uh, quality of that data set, but that's been classified. And there are also a couple of efforts to actually map peatlands globally, not only in the tropical regions, but also in other regions in Northern Hemisphere. So uh, it's a challenge, but it's, it's doable. And I think probably in the next few years, you will see more results coming out. The USGS data is online. You can actually download it. But it gives you probably partially where the um, peatlands might be. Okay, we got another round of questions. We had one big hand here in the front row, and then Alain right behind him, and then this hand near the aisle. This, yeah, right there, there you go. Uh, hi, my name is Julian Molrochek. Uh, I write for Mongo Bay. Um, I wanted to ask about how, so, Greg, you mentioned that uh, characterizing degradation is becoming kind of standard. Um, can any of you talk to the characterization of secondary forest regrowth, and how can that help us untangle those semantic issues that you touched on, Matt? Okay. Alain? So I am Alain Billon, working at CIRAD French Resource Center. So my question is about offer and demand. <coughs> um, as you know, decision making is all about making options for the future. So how do you use your technology now to help to design scenarios, for example? How do you project? Do you work on models or would you plan to do that? Okay. Uh, my name is Jackson Kimani, Clinton Foundation. I speak for the demand side, and my question is on these technologies are primarily to estimate emissions or to monitor deforestation. And those are not one-off processes. Those are processes that need to happen on a continuous basis. And my question is, has there been a thought process in terms of uh, how do you ensure that these technologies are taken, especially by governments, in a way that they can be able to carry these on a going forward basis, ongoing basis. For instance, the work that Greg has been doing in Peru, was there any structure systems that were being set up as this technology was being transferred to ensure that uh, this is not just a project, Peru can be able to assume this responsibility on a go forward basis. Okay, great. Um, three pretty clear questions. Who'd like to start on the regrowth one? I can do it. I can. Uh, Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, go Just ahead. Hit, okay, hit, Matt, hit. go first. <laughs> Isn't that the deal you made? <laughs> so anyway, so uh, regrowth. Um, well, if I think, I think, if we know where the natural forests are, and, and from a remote sensing perspective, um, certainly for the rainforest, the humid tropical forest, we have a pr we we can map that directly. Uh, I, I like the, the, the way that Brazil's approached it, that you have this static mask that really erodes over time. You could have rules for recovery, 
Um, but it is the, the high conservation value forest, high biomass forest, and that's your bank of carbon, and that's the thing that, that you want to look inside for, 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 for disturbance. The regrowth can be, like in Central Africa, it's the bulk of the dynamic. You have whole landscapes that just turn over, and depending on the population pressure, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. And so if you want to do a holistic kind of big, you know, all at once, you, you need to include that in your, in your dynamic. But again, we, we see the regrowth over time. It is not the reciprocal of change because it's a gradual recovery, but we do, depending on the latitude uh, and, and, the, and the, you know, the, how quickly the environment allows trees to recover, we can quantify this change and, and be very confident that we see tree recovery and tree regrowth and label it as such. Um, and then we could go to a further typology where you might want to uh, uh, just do the, um, the you know, the, the um, sorry, rubber versus palm. We can aspire to that. I don't think that's a big deal. What, what I do think is a bigger deal is uh, in the natural forest domain, there's a lot of natural disturbance. There's storm blowdowns, there are river meanders, there are uh, landslides. And we're working on spatial shape and temporal, multispectral kind of signature spaces to identify the fire that caused forest canopy loss, that, 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 that was a blowdown, versus the mechanical removals, which we have more direct control over in terms of regulation. Um, so that, that inside that protist mass is something that, that I think we need to, to work on to, to keep control of uh, you know, the, the high biomass and recovery. I think we'll get better with it when we have these longer time series and we see these trajectories we map explicitly over time. But one thing probably may happen in future which kind of resolve this issue of terminologies and stuff. If you have a system in space or even with aircraft that you can monitor the carbon change, you automatically would be able to see the regrowth in areas. So hopefully if you have a system that is sensitive to that level of biomass and you're annually looking at the landscape, and you would see the biomass changing from one lab level to another level, you would locate the areas that are gaining carbon to relative to the areas that are not gaining carbon. So it's possible that in future we can actually overcome this issue by just monitoring the biomass change. And then areas that change is enough to call it secondary forest, uh, of course, you need to have the land use activity before it to name it, but that gain would also be established through um, a direct monitoring of the biomass or carbon. Anything to add to that one? No, I was going to move on. To okay, you want to do first on the scenarios? Uh, yeah, that was a great question. I, I gave a tiny piece of what's going on today, and what's in the 3D imaging and for structure world, there's a lot of repeat LIDAR going on. And those time series of LIDAR analyses, at least what I see in my small niche of the community, is those are being ingested into models to, do, to, to come up with rules of the game, to come up with what we call transfer functions or any kinds of however you want to call them that say, in these land use scenarios, in these kinds of land use intensity scenarios, this is the actual evolution in terms of the structure of the canopy changing. And those principles are being put into models now. It's in the R&D side. That stuff hasn't been, if this is the question, it hasn't really been scaled up and ingested into the kind of the larger scale scenarios modeling that you see going on, say, at the basin level for the Amazon. So these things, like all things, are coming. But I think your interest is more in translation into the policy realm. Is that right, Alain? Yeah, OK. Um, maybe, Crystal, do you have a comment on this before we go to Congresswoman Lord? No? 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 OK. Um, so Congresswoman Lourdes, I mean, Lopez, um, the question is, you know, how can this data be translated into, you know, forward-looking what's going to happen so that policy strategies can be based on scenarios? Is that right, Ellen, um, that, that this new data can help us build? Do you have any comment on the potential utility of, of this data for that purpose? Potencial de todos estos datos, señora. I think that the use of these data could be extremely interesting in the sense of how they are applied in the mechanisms of decision making. If you see how in a determined zone of a country 
we have generated more loss of uh, uh, forest coverage than we can generate a process in order to know whether we must or, or this is due to uh, uh, unlawful uh, logging or any um, pests or whatever. Now, once you have found out what is the cause of this loss, then you can decide or determine what is the mechanism of action to fight against this uh, situation. So I think this would be the use of these da data. Moreover, all these technologies that I have been, uh, I, I have come close to, they generate models. Some tendencies seem to indicate what their effects are going to be in 5, 10, 50 years. And all that information allows also uh, taking a decision in order to stop that tendency or reverse it. What is the mechanism, the strategy, the reform of the legislation of the country or the need to change? political po uh, policies in the country or some special attention in a s given region of a country and so on. And so at the end of the day, the information and the several scenarios that we see will let us take very well informed decisions from a activity and action or, a, you know, legislation at national level. Great, so it's kind of like moving from the short-term alarm system to a longer-term time scale and developing strategies to address them after that. Crystal, do you want to talk about the, the question of how to, what systems are being put into place to help governments, you know, institutionalize these uh, data interpretation systems? Sure, and I'd be curious to hear Flores about this as well. Um, so this is a really interesting question for Global Forest Watch and one that we're actively grappling with right now. Um, I think that there are at least three things that are needed to make a tool like Global Forest Watch appealing for government institutions to consider taking up. I think one, it needs to be very easy to use. Two, it needs to be very affordable. And three, it needs to be useful for them. And then we've, we've lost a mic. You, you want me to elaborate? You want it? You want it? <laughs> Can we have a handheld mic? We're, we're going to bring you a handheld mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then to elaborate on that third point about being useful, I think that means that the system also needs to be customizable because there's never going to be a single tool that works for every country. So I think that Global Forest Watch has done the first two things really well so far in terms of being easy to use and being affordable, but we still have work to do on making it customizable so that countries can really take ownership of the system and make it their own. Uh, I think that's going to be an important next step for us. And then even, even if you create the perfect tool that really is a great solution for many countries, it doesn't mean that people are going to take it up. Um, so I think an important thing will be to work with the willing and to then be able to show and document how that's been useful and how that's resulted in very practical cost savings for countries even. And I think that Brazil is a great example of this because they've been really pioneering the near real-time monitoring space with PRODIS and DETER, and now you're seeing the replication of those types of systems across the world. Do you have any comment on this? Sí, eh, coincido totalmente con Cristal en el sentido de que debe tener esas tres características. Well, they have to have these three characteristics so that a government may be able to adopt this kind of system. But I would also insist in the need for the governments to be able to understand their functionality. Maybe say, I will invest $250 million in this tool when uh, I have uh, a need uh, of a public policy uh, for a social issue. So we need to generate more understanding. And I think there's a key, a key tool, the scheme of uh, natural capital, to be able to understand that all that natural capital we have in certain countries could also represent a number of resources in an economic scheme. So, well, it sounds very ugly to say it, maybe, but at the end of the day, our forests, our biodiversity, our uh, rainforests have an economic value, so we need to invest in order to preserve that economic value. And also, linking to your earlier point about seeing investment in the data generation as an investment as opposed to just an ongoing cost for the same reason, right? Yes. Okay, two quick comments from you two, and then we're going to go back for one lightning round of questions. Uh, I don't know if people realize it, but there's some very different models sitting up here. These folks are doing this incredible work bringing these global uh, capabilities to the user, to you. Uh, 
some of us do it a different way. We, we tend to do very deep, detailed, long-term, structured capacity building projects in countries. And the, the question about Peru, I've been here eight years, working within the Ministry of Environment since the ministry was born, and they have extremely good capability in deforestation, forest degradation, and carbon mapping. Maybe the best on the planet, for all I know. Um, but the point is, is that now's the time for us to find, I think, our challenge as a community is to find ways for people like me who do deep dives into specific countries, into specific places, to fuse that with these global capabilities and bring that kind of structure together. The, the deep dive produces a lot of trust uh, along, you know, in the long term. The global side doesn't get to interact with everybody and develop trust necessarily, so fusing those might be a, a critical way for us to move forward as a community. I would, I would just add to not let uh, the perfect be the enemy to the good. So to get in the game, how, do, how can you get in the game without burdening your capacity, overloading your capacity? So for example, a forest type map that has plus or minus value mass uh, numbers associated with it that you have already in hand, while in a research and development mode you add some of the higher, fancier technology. So dis distinguishing between operational capabilities and research and development and, and trying to get numbers out right now with defensible good practices and then, you know, partition your office or you leverage universities or whatever to, to get the new technologies ready as they come. And I think, you know, in the Republic of Congo, there's not a remote sensing course in any university. So we don't want, the Rep I, I don't think, I'm speaking for the Republic of Congo, whatever, but it's not a great idea to think that uh, they're going to be processing terabytes and terabytes of data, geometric corrections, radiometric corrections. They have to do a little bit of a leapfrog tech, you know, uh, kind of angle to, to get in the game. So that's a little case specific thing, but be very pragmatic to get in the game. Okay, we are rapidly running out of time, but I will uh, remedy the deficit of calling on people on this side and allow two questions. I see one here and one in the back. Please be brief. Doug Boucher from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, my question is for Crystal. Uh, you pointed out uh, the growing cacophony of, of data products and maps, and as you and, and Lars in his question indicated, many times they don't agree, sometimes substantially. Um, naively, I would think that one of the ways to solve that is to have all the map layers on one site where users could look at them scientists could analyze the differences, could overlay them all and, and see uh, where they disagree uh, so that everybody's maps, you know, Greg's and Matt's and Sasan's and Impe's and Peru's and the JRC's and everybody else's Cut to the chase, Doug. Be there. <laughs> Are you moving in that direction? Okay. Uh, Mikkel, I think. Good afternoon, uh, Michael Bucchi, European Commission. Thank you very much to all the presenters. I had a question on the cost. Assuming that, be it at country or at global level, you have done all the work to get good information on emissions from deforestation in a red plus context, what does it cost to go the extra mile and derive information on biodiversity, haze, or drivers, for instance? What's, what's the, in relative terms, what's the extra cost? Okay. Uh, I note that every question and comment has come from a man. So if there is a person with an X chromosome, uh, two X chromosomes, who would like to ask a question, please <laughs> raise your hand now. No women would That'd like to speak. Question. Ah, That'd thank you very question. much. Right there in the pink blazer. I love it. Okay. <laughs> right here in the front row. Henrietta Boyd from Permian Global. Um, as an interested but semi-educated project developer, how on earth is one able to make a decision about what to use? Because it's a joy to see you guys up on the panel together, but there are other operators out there. Okay, so we are down to five minutes. So what I will do is turn to my left and give each of my panelists one minute to respond to whichever of those questions they feel most competent or energized to respond to. Greg, you hmm. have one minute. Oh, I got 
My, I'd like to start with Henrietta's uh, question. It's, it is tough right now, and that's a good sign. There's a lot out there to choose from. But think about Copenhagen in 09. There was very little to choose from, right? So we're kind of going through this, I hope it's not a bubble, but this peak. And I think your question motivates us. It needs to motivate the science community to start to put these together, start to not, only have, not just have one method, but to have intercompatible methods with, that, that can transfer uncertainty between them and provide non-remote sensing experts with that knowledge up front so that almost the choice starts to be uh, inconsequential. That we're not there yet, but I think we actually have the tools and the know-how to do that, and I think it's really a matter of motivating ourselves to get to it. Okay. Matt? Yeah, I, I think that one thing, even in, in the remote sensing community, we didn't validate our, we were just happy to make a map even 10 years ago. Um, and now we have to get into, and we are getting into this habit of having independent validation of these maps in establishing accuracy and un associated you know, uncertainties. So that's the standard. And anybody can validate the global map at any scale and prove or disprove its utility. So it's not really like you have five maps without context. You have no basis for making a decision there. there. So uh, when Google Earth Engine started, you know, I told Rebecca Moore, you're going to have a thousand lousy maps, you know? I remember that. And we have to, we have to f stress that a map by itself without this other evaluation is not a credible input. And then it, that's, that's my response to that. Sasa? I think to follow on, this, this thing comes out a lot, that when there are several maps, especially carbon estimates, that sometimes they don't match. Um, how do we make a decision which one to use? I think economists and even in the science community, we are a little bit more comfortable with this because having more information, it would help you a little bit to know exactly where you lack uh, data and where you lack uh, uh, accurate information. So it would be good to use all of them eventually, and we have proven in our cases that these uh, several maps in a lot of areas they're starting to agree with each other as our methodologies mature. So using different data sets, I think it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's good and it's, uh, uh, having those available to us is, uh, is, is actually a fortunate thing. And the decisions should be made by consulting, I think, uh, many information. And it would, it would be more realistic. And Crystal, I need at least a brief comment on the biodiversity cost question from you. On what? The biodiversity cost question. Miko's cost. What was the additional question? cost of adding biodiversity to these data sets? Uh, well, so we are working on bringing in biodiversity data into the Global Forest Watch platform. Uh, right now we're starting with existing species and habitat data that can we believe can add value when you combine it with this forest change data. But we're also looking at how we can start combining that data in ways that create new indices uh, that can make us help us more cost effectively track progress towards things like the EG targets. But then to comment really question, the short answer to your question, Doug, is yes. I think putting all this data transparently in one place will help the scientific community sort out the differences. But I also think for the 99% of us that aren't scientists, people do want our help in trying to say, you know, what does all of this mean? And I think that's a role for Global Forest Watch to play as well. So we're trying to do both. Congresswoman Lopez, last comment. That's a great point. <coughs> you need to have the intermediate. Bueno, básicamente, insistir en que toda esta información this need is forward. There is somebody interested in knowing what's going on, specifically some, sometimes in political, there are politicians that think they are always right and they never consult any data. It's a pity. But these exercises of consulting and communicating with the rest of the world and the scientific con community, Technicians and uh, the like will, will enable us to take decisions as a planet, as a country, a better uh, decision. And as far as costs of including biodiversity in your own way, I, I cannot tell you how much that would cost, but I can tell you that it would be extremely important to have those details because sadly, in countries like mine, Mexico, many of the uh, losses in biodiversity has have to do with the, with the use of our wealth, this wealth, for economic reasons of some populations. But when we are capable of 
demonstrating that keeping the life of a of, of a, a jaguar or a lion uh, and uh, uh, forest instead of selling the wood or the fur will be something better that will be the day when we manage to make this possibility understood to others in order to consolidate our own development then we will manage to have a better balance in the sustainability of life on our planet thank you y sobre esa nota creo que ya se nos escapó el tiempo. Muchas gracias a todos por hacer de esta sesión tan interesante. Muchas gracias a los panelistas. Un aplauso para todos ellos.